So let's read uh, chapter 1, uh, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. I'm the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that he may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which has spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit in and of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine and you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gathered them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Well, just to start it off, I really believe that verse 8 just sums up everything. The Father is going to be glorified by us bearing fruit. But let's put this in context of what's taking place. If you would, save your spot. We'll be back in just a minute. For me, I'm going to turn my page. For you, if you go over to chapter 13, it's kind of where the story kind of picks up. Here we are in what's known as the Passion Week. Chapter 13, we know is the time of the Passover. And we see it was a time where Judas was about to betray Jesus. In verse 2 in chapter 13 Supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And so he does. If you, go, if you look down, he begins to wash the disciples' feet, and he has a conversation in the next few verses with Peter. He says, you don't need to wash me. And he says, then wash all of me, right, in verse 8. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, verse 9, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Look at verse 10, if you would. Jesus said to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but he but is completely clean, and you are clean. Notice what he says then, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. You are not all clean. In verse 21, he sa it says, When Jesus said these things, he was troubled in his spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. So what happens? He hands Judas the bread and he betrays him and he says, Go and do what you're going to do. Chapter 14, we know, is a very powerful passage where Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. But then we get into chapter 15. And they had left this place. They're on this road, most likely heading to the garden there, where we know it's about to take place. He's just going to be praying, stressed, sweating drops of blood, all these things. And, and yet, as they're walking, I wonder what everybody's thinking. What just happened? One of us betray? Who, is it I, Lord? Who would do this? We wouldn't do this. Who would do this? Judas did this? Why would Judas do this? Judas had the, Why did this happen? And what, this is important for us tonight. Because for all purposes... To discuss, listen, there was no reason for them to consider Judas. None. For the fact that all of them are sitting there. Is it I? Who would it be? It wasn't like everybody was like, oh, here it goes. Judas is about to, right? You know what I mean? It wasn't like, uh-oh, uh-oh, Jesus and Judas, they're going, it's going down right now, right? It wasn't that. I mean, if it was that, then it would be kind of like, oh, 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 I'm going to step back. I'm going to watch what's going to happen. So it took place. And as they're walking, I believe this is an illustration, a metaphor that Jesus used to explain that situation, that story. Oh, there was the 12, but now there's just the 11. And let me tell you about this branch. And he goes on and he first starts off by saying, I'm, I'm the vine. I'm not just the vine, any vine, I'm the true vine. 
Why is that so important? Well, because in the Old Testament, well, first of all, we know that the vine has two branches, one that bears fruit and one that doesn't. But when we get into the Old Testament and you look in context and stuff of the, the vine and the branches, you know that Israel was the vine. Yet, what happened? Well, what happened was this. God repeatedly used the vine as a symbol of his people. Psalm 80, verse 8 and 9, it says, You have brought a vine out of Egypt. You, you have cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root, and it filled the land. Oh, God was the vine dresser, and Israel was the vine, and those who were united with Israel were very blessed and all, and he would prune, and he would do all these things, and yet there was also this negative sense that took place. For example, in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it says, Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared it out, its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. There in Isaiah chapter 5, also in verse 7, it says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Or in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 21, he says this, Yet I have planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. How then have you turned before me into the degenerate plant of an alien vine? Why a vine? Why a vine rather than other plants? Well, it's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture here where he says, listen, you might have in your mindset Israel, God's chosen people. You might have in your mindset when you picture this vine, there was vines all around them. And so let's use this as an illustration and let's see. But he says, listen, I want you to know that I'm the true vine. See, where the nation failed God, Jesus had been the complete embodiment of everything we're supposed to be, the true vine. And we must be rooted in him if we're to bear fruit. And of the many pictures of the relationship between God and his people, the vine and branch picture emphasizes complete dependence and the need for constant connection. It was said by a vine dresser this, they have a saying, it's called, growth follows the knife. Man, when I read that, I was just mesmerized by it. I'm going, that's so true of us sometimes, isn't it? Lord, what are you doing? <laughs> that hurts. <laughs> Stop it. This pruning, this cutting away. But this pruning isn't a one-time thing. See, when you prune a branch, there's a time of bleeding the bleeding of the sap. But it's interesting, I was reading up on this bleeding and it said it's much better to bleed with the sap than to wither and burn. Powerful, huh? It's much better to bleed than to wither and burn. See, we may look at the pruning as a painful thing, but we have to understand that that pruning that takes place has nothing to do with chastening. It has nothing to do with correcting, as it tells us in Hebrews chapter 12. He says, no, listen, I'm pruning you to bear more fruit. Oh, it's powerful. I have a couple of pictures. If we put up the first one, I was listening to a story about a man who had uh, interviewed a vine dresser. And he said the first thing, he said this, a mature vine consists of a root system. The root system will go down to as much as 40 feet deep. And not only that, he said, the tips of the roots are actually very raw and bare because as they dive into the soil, they're grabbing that nutrients and bringing them in. And as they're coming in, and they're growing, and it grows into what is the trunk. And from the trunk, the vine dresser would make a trellis, usually a, a post and two wires. And on one of those wires, or on that wire, you can see here even in that picture, the vine dresser would actually tie, the, the, the vine would grow out from the trunk into these what is called arms. Two arms, usually, two to four arms, out onto that, that cable, that trellis. And so of the vine, we have 
the root system, the trunk, and the arms consisting of the vine. And that's where it gets the nutrients from the soil. From all these things. And Jesus said, listen, I'm the true vine. See, the nutrients flow from the soil to the roots, to the trunk, to the arms. He says, I bring you the nutrients. And it says, God is the vine dresser, the husbandman. It's been said that his arms represent a glorified Christ who is now at the right hand of the Father. He has every source and every resource we need to produce fruit. From there comes what is called the shoots. These shoots are buds that come up, and uh, if you see them over there on the, my right, your left, the shoots are canes. And it looks like, if you go to picture number two, in picture number two, you see the beginning of these shoots are these buds, these spurs, they call them. Now, it's interesting because when you look at that, I mean, if you're driving, you're like, oh, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> you think they're all dead, right? I mean, you think there's no life there. Oh, man, how wrong are we? See, there are these shoots that grow, and they will take the wrong. But here's what happens. Sometimes these shoots grow, and they grow down in a way that they try to begin and grow new roots. And they try to begin to grow and, and, and become their own root system. Just like our flesh, right? Wanting to do it our way. And if we don't cut that out, they're going to grow into being like these little Jesuses. Doing what we want, what we think is right. Doing it our way. See, these buds, if you would, the next picture, grow into branches. See, the vine itself does not bear the fruit. The branches bear the fruit. Imagine how it goes from that dead-looking plant, that dead-looking just pieces of wood, to this, to this. What's the next one? To eventually this. The next one. Mm. But if you would go back to the second picture. See, we all need for life and holiness, all we need, and we all need this. Everything we need is found in Jesus. It starts here. It starts with the minimum. And it's interesting because what we see so often is the world wants to offer us something that looks so much more attractive. I'll get it that way. I'll take for myself something that looks more that, that looks better for what I need. But in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by the glory of the Father. The nutrients produced, listen, this is interesting. The nutrients produced in this plant produce something that's almost like an antifreeze that actually keeps it from freezing in cold weather. But if it doesn't get the nutrients it needs, that water turns into ice and actually freezes and kills the plant. God has set this up so that everything and the way it's supposed to work is just perfect for growth. But it's interesting for us because the Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I don't want you to go after the nutrients that you need. I don't want you in the Word. I don't want you in fellowship. I don't want you in the Word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause chaos in your life. I'm going to do things to keep you away from the Word of God and get, keep you away from Jesus. And the church is hypocrites and there's drama in church and there's cliques and there's all they want is our money and all these other things and our hearts and our minds are away from Jesus. And it's on people and it's on things and it's on, but my loved one's dying and God wasn't there. And where's God in the earthquakes and the hurricanes and the plains and the, and the fires and all this other stuff? And it's like, so our hearts and our minds and the enemy's coming to steal, kill and destroy. And, and what should be this nourishment? See, it's interesting. There's, in, in these vines, there's these like capillary type things, these veins that actually take the nutrients and the soil from the trunk, into the arms, into the shoots, and the branches begin to grow. 
But it's interesting because it said, if the vine dresser doesn't cut off the dead branches, then the sap, the healthy nutrients are going to try to get to that. And then the, the fruit isn't going to be as healthy, isn't going to be as fruitful, isn't going to be as big because all the sap, all the nutrients that needed to get to that plant had a detour and was going in the wrong direction to the wrong, to dead wood, to dead wood. Now, it's interesting more about this. See, he says that the vine and the vine dresser have this interesting relationship. He says the vine dresser knows his, his vines. A few interesting things. Vines usually last from 100 to 200 years old. Now, vines have to be cut down to this every year. Every year gets back to this. Every year. Produce fruit, super healthy, beautiful, healthy grapes, and all of a sudden, this. And for us, we can think, what are you doing? Why would you do that? Look at how healthy it was. But see, the vine dresser isn't hurting it, it's helping it. He loves it. He knows, listen, if I do this, next year's fruit, bigger, better, the vine's stronger, the branches are stronger. Listen, I'm do when they plant vineyards, most vine dressers do not try to even get a harvest for the first four years because they wait till the trunk is thick enough, stronger. And so as it grows, they just cut it off, cut it off. Cut it off. Why? It's not ready yet. It's not healthy yet. It's not where it needs to be yet. Oh, but it's getting there. Oh, it's getting there. And, and, but here's the thing. The vine dresser knows the vine. And he knows the branches. But think about this. Go to the third picture, if you would. If he just let the vine just keep growing. Oh, it was, we, you know, like the fifth picture with the, the huge grapes and whatnot. Oh, it's so healthy. Let's just keep letting it grow, right? Oh, right? Think about your ministry. But we had such a healthy spiritual year, such a productive year. So God has been so good. But listen, you don't cut that back. It's going to keep growing and growing and growing. And the further it grows, the further away from the vine it is. The further away from the vine it is, the smaller the grapes, the more sour. You ever been in the sour grapes? Oh, my goodness. The smaller, the more sour, and the, the more unhealthy they are. Got to cut them off. There's a reason behind all this. And Jesus is telling this story, and he says, I'm the vine. My father's the vine dresser. I got you. I know what you need, and I know who's mine, and I know Who's not? My father's the vine dresser. In verse 2, it says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it may bear more fruit. When he cuts off the, the branches, even the healthy ones, the technical term that the vine dresser actually has is called old wood. There is a term for a branch that bore fruit this past year. But he says, listen, i got to cut off the old wood. And he has a term that he says, you have to have what is called rod renewal. That is that little stump in picture two, if you would. Those little spurs, if you would. He says, that's what you need. We're going to cut it back to just that. Those are about four inches or so in height. And we're going to cut it back to just that. But there has to be this rod renewal. And I wonder how many of you you know, when we talk about men's, uh, men's uh, studies starting up, women's studies starting up, men's retreats and all these other things, it's so easy to live off the past, isn't it? You ever think back of those amazing times, you and God? But how long ago were those amazing times? Yesterday? Last year? Five years ago? How come it's not fresh anymore? Are you afraid to be pruned? Are you living off the past? 
are you living off like, oh, I was healthy once and I have these old stories. Let me tell you this time where God used me. Man, but God wants to use you even more. See, the vine dresser knows how healthy it once was, but he goes, listen, you don't see what's around the corner, but next year, I want more fruit, healthier fruit. Oh, I got some amazing things in store for your life. You you don't even know. Oh, for you, it seems scary because you feel like this. You feel like I'm dry now. Ah, ah, Lord, or picture three. Lord, I, I feel okay. My walk's not that bad. But, Lord, I, I, I have a little, I'm in church all the time. He goes, oh, yeah, picture five. He goes, this is what I have for you. This. Not, not, not picture three. This. I don't want you to have a little branches and whatnot like it's all, oh, I'm healthy. I'm a Christian. I go to church. I'm involved in a ministry. No, no, no. He's like, yeah, I got to prune some of that. Don't, but Lord, that was my fruitful part. Oh, yeah? Philip, right? He was called, right? Paul's like, I'm not called to wait tables. Or not Paul. Philip was called, right, to be in leadership, right? And so what happens? Ministry's taken off, right? God's doing some amazing things. Like, I want you to leave. I want you to go down this road, you know? He's like, what's down there? Nothing. Ethiopian reading the book of Isaiah. He's like, what are you reading? I don't know. I don't have anybody explain it to me. Oh, yeah, I got you. Let's talk. Jumped in, started talking. You know, what's preventing me from being baptized? Nothing. Let's do this, right? All of a sudden, he's like, that's what it was for. You didn't know it was down this road because you thought there was nothing down this road. No, I had healthy fruit down this road. I have something more for you than you even let yourself have. But you're so caught up in yesterday. You're so caught up in the here and now. You're not letting yourself be pruned. Sorry, am I yelling? (laughs) I apologize. I don't mean to. (laughs) But listen, you may feel dry after bearing fruit, but the Lord says, I've got much more for you. I have this newness. It's going to be new wood a new rod, a new branch. And for those of us that don't understand it, God will do everything in his power to get you back to your first love. So you can't live off your past experiences and don't just live off your memories of the fruitful times. But notice he says in verse 3, the, 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 the pruning knife, you're already clean because of the word which has spoken to you. The vine dresser's pruning knife, his word. Man, that's powerful, isn't it? See, one of the most loving things a vine dresser can do is speak his word into your life. And then there's going to be this cutting away. The Bible tells us things like flee sin and the weight that easily ensnares us, right? Run. Or not that I've been... That not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'm going to have you start thinking differently. I'm going to have you start living differently. I'm going to have you start speaking differently. I'm going to have you start acting differently. You know, with these hurricanes and all this stuff and so many people going off to uh, Texas and other places and, and eventually probably Florida and uh, as we've done in uh, when we used to go to Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, right? And after Katrina and, and Haiti and different things. What caused us to say, I'm going to give up my vacation. I'm going to pay my way to go serve other people. Where did that come from? Because most of us are selfish. But God's beginning to prune that selfishness in us and helping us to see his righteousness. And we're beginning to get rid of our self-righteousness and our selfishness. And we're starting to be holy. And we're becoming more like Christ. And we're bearing fruit. And that fruit is love. It's grace. It's mercy. It's long-suffering. And he says, this is what I have for you. But I don't just have a little bit. Because as you're growing, I'm going to cut it off so that more can grow. 
more that can grow. Oh, and it's going to be so beautiful. What is he pruning? Again, he's pruning our self-righteousness. He's pruning our human effort to produce a righteousness that is pleasing to him. And how do we know when we need to be pruned? I think an easy way is often that I could say, look at what I've done. Look at the ministry I'm doing. And the Lord's like, oh, yeah? Let me get my knife out. What'd you do? Nothing, Lord. <laughs> it was you. <laughs> and he goes, I'm going to humble you. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that hurts, right? You ever pray for patience? How do you know when you get them? <laughs> when you have junior hires. <laughs> no. <laughs> And he says, what do you need to do? Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. Now, word abide means this, to, to make camp, to settle here. Here's the thing. Picture two. I found what I'm looking for. Lord, I need to be right there. I'm not going anywhere. Because, Lord, you're rooted, your trunk is healthy, and, Lord, you're just waiting for me to get up there and grow. I'm not going anywhere. I found what I'm looking for. I found my identity in Christ. I realize now, because the Scriptures tell me that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am saved by grace through faith and not of my works. Matter of fact, I am now his workmanship, his poema. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's you. That's me. Oh, but we might be like Paul where the Lord told him as he was going from Saul to Paul, I'm going to show him all the things he must suffer for my name's sake. But when we read in Philippians, man, and if you're struggling, read Philippians. Where he just says, listen, I got this, Lord. Lord, I want to go. I want to go and be with you. But, Lord, I know you haven't called me home yet, so I'm going to press on. I'm going to keep moving forward towards you, Jesus, because you're all I have. You're my nourishment. You're my everything. I found what I was looking for. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to abide in the vine. Where else am I going to go? Because if I leave this place, I'm going to wither. And if I try to move away from this, I'm going to just be sour. And the further I am from the vine, the unhealthier I'm going to be. So, Lord, I'm going to plant myself right here with you. There's no place I'd rather be. Remember the old song? Than in your arms of love. Oh, holding me still, holding me near. Remember that song? In your arms of love. Isn't that amazing that they actually call them arms? And, Lord, you hold me so I might rise that I might rise and branch out and blossom and that I might grow healthy and strong in you. Because seeing the Lord, he'll present us faultless. He will. He will even prune the good things in our life to make them better, to, to cause us to trust even more. And I wonder, for some of you who are older in the faith, well, for example, I, uh, this Friday I'm doing a memorial, and I met with the family this week. And I said, can you tell me about your loved one? They said, yeah. And they said this right before she passed. This is what she said. I love Jesus. I know he loves me. I've done everything and seen everything in my life that I wanted to see and do, and I'm ready. And the family with mixed emotions, there was like this joy and sadness, right? You know, they were, they were excited. They're like, she's in heaven. She's in heaven. Like she looked forward from 18 years old till the day she passed to being with Jesus. And she loved people and she grew and everyone knew that she loved Jesus because she loved them. 
And there was this aroma of, oh my goodness, there was this aroma. Listen. How fair is your love? Song of Solomon 4.10. How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse. How much better than wine is your love. Listen, and the scent of your perfumes than all spices. When we're with the Lord, there's this aroma. When we're close to him, there's this aroma. There's something about you. There's something in this person's life that says, what, that makes people go, what is it about you? What is it in your life that is causing this joy in the midst of trials, in the midst of suffering and all these things? What is it in your life? Oh, it's the fact that I've had the privilege and I have that opportunity and I've learned just to simply abide in the Lord. See, we love him because he first loved us. In Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 7, verse 12, let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine has budded, whether the grape uh, blossoms are open and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. Oh, if you would, verse uh, 4, or picture 4. Don't you want to just hang out there? Right? I mean, from picture two to this, don't you just want to like walk through there and just rest in this and go, this is healthy. This is beautiful. This is the way it's supposed to be when it's healthy, when it's being nurtured. This is what I want in my life. Lo, that there would be rows and rows and rows of fruitfulness in my life. So whether I'm at church or work, or in my house, or, or at the store, or everywhere I go, Lord, they might see fruit in my life. That people might see this healthiness. That people might know, Lord, that I'm with you, and I'm planted. I'm abiding in the vine, and the vine in me. Oh, it's such a beautiful, beautiful picture. Abide in, verse 4, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit in of itself. I want you to notice again, First of all, verse, uh, picture two, there's no fruit here. There's no branch. Picture three, the branches begin, and thus, this is where fruit begins. This is where the fruit comes. But as we look at all these things, he says, verse four, neither can you unless you abide in me. See, if that if one of these branches is growing, we're like, oh, this is nice. I'm going to cut it off. No more nutrients. No more health. You ever met people? Yeah, I'm a Christian. I just don't go to church. I don't believe in organized religion. I don't, you know, I'm just doing my thing. Really? If you're not in the vine, man, you can't grow. If if you're not with the Lord, you can't grow. Here's the problem. There are people even in the church that are Judases. Listen, they didn't, they're, going back to chapter 13, is it I, Lord? Could it be me? There was nothing that gave it away at the time that it was Judas. There was nothing that said, oh yeah, of course it's him. Why is this so difficult? Why to bring this up? Well, because here's the thing. Because when we do tasks and we get this mindset, of course they were with the Lord. They were leaders. They served in the church. They were at church all the time. Really? Did they abide in the vine? You thought they did. Just like everybody thought Judas did. And it seemed like they were. But even Jesus said, you went out, but you were never of. Oh, you came out from our presence, but you were never of. In verse 5, it says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Much fruit. 
But you got to abide in the Lord. You got to stay there. Stay with him. Does it get hard? And for those of you who are new Christians, let me tell you a story. It's simple. It gets harder. It gets harder. Anybody else? Man, when, when you first saved, you're like, you need Jesus. God loves you. God, lo God loves everybody. Wow, this feeling so emotion, all this other stuff. And I had a friend uh, we led to the Lord, and uh, he used to tell me every time he got saved, his name's Tony, he's a good friend of mine still, like, every time he got saved, get goosebumps. And he came to me one day, he's like, Dustin, call me up, get over here. Get over there, come hang out. He's like, look at Jesus. He's literally, he's like, did he leave me? Gives his life to the Lord. His wife leaves him, lost his business, all this other stuff. And he's just like, what happened? And, and, it, and it's so easy, right, to turn from our, uh, our attention on the Lord going, oh, goosebumps. Lord, you're, do, you're so amazing. Look at this feeling that I have and this emotion that I have in your presence. And he goes, but I want so much more for you. I want you to know me. I want you to know my character. I don't want you to know me by what people say, but I want you to be in my word. I want my word to penetrate your heart, and I want you to know who I am and what I have in store for you. So when people start saying things about how I should move or how I shouldn't move, you could say, that's not true because this is who he is. Because we know the vine dresser. And we know the vine dresser is investing in the vine. And the vine is investing in us. You know what's interesting? That story with the, the man that met with the vine dresser, he said, what happens, if you would, uh, the final picture, he said, once it gets to this level, there's these sugars that grow and, and begin to produce in the grapes as well as in the leaves, and it sends nutrients in separate capillaries back down into the roots. I don't know if you heard me, but abide in me and I in you. We're working together here with the Lord. He's like, listen, I'm bringing you some nutrients. Oh, yeah, I'm going to send some back. We're working. And he's like, I love you. Oh, Lord, I love you too. Building each other up. I have more for you. And God has this picture for us. Verse 6, it says, if anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. The sad part about that is they're not burned for heat or anything else. He says these pieces of wood are what they call simply dead wood. It's good for nothing. It's just withered and they just toss it. And it's like, that's not what I have for you. I have so much more for you. In verse 7, it says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Now, it's interesting because I think a lot of people can take that verse out of context. But if we read it simply as it is, it's not hard to take out of, uh, in context, if you would. If you abide in me, my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. See, I'm not desiring houses and boats and cars and all this other stuff, right? Why? Because His Word is abiding in me. I'm focused on that. I'm focused, Lord, not my will, but Your will be done. So when I ask for things, I'm asking, Lord, in Your name, Lord, this, meet the needs of this loved one. Lord, meet the needs of these people. Lord, provide, Lord, save, God, Grace, God, your mercy, God, your compassion, and so on. I'm not looking for my selfish gain. No, and the Lord's like, oh, I want to meet your needs. Why? Because your will is in line with mine. As my word is abiding, is being stored, is kept with you. And he says in verse 8, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. When it says my father is glorified, he says it, it simply means my father is honored. That you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. If you would, go to picture two. 
It starts with him. Picture three. He says, as you abide in me, and I in you. Then the shoots grow out into branches. The branches begin to grow leaves and then fruit. The vine dresser keeps pruning and pruning and keeping it so that it's in a place where it can grow healthy and stay as close to the vine as possible and be as fruitful and healthy as possible so that in picture four, our lives would be healthy and grow. Because he doesn't have just this for us. He has in picture five, he says, I have so much more for you than you can ever imagine. I have so much more that I want to do in your life than you can ever imagine. And you don't even understand and you don't know, but it's just around the corner. But I have to prune you. I have to take things out of your life. And I'm going to use my word to speak into your life to say that's not what I have for you because I have so much more. That you might flee sin. That you might run to him. And that he, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, that we would see him for who he is. That we would be, well, as the scriptures tell us, that we would be rooted and built up and established in the faith. Picture three, Lord, you're the vine, and we're the branches. And Lord, I know that only in you I can bear much fruit. So my question tonight is this. Are you grafted in? Are you abiding in the vine? Are you allowing God to prune your life? Are you even in it all? Are you dead wood? Are you old wood? That the Lord says, no, listen, i got to cut that off. I have something new and fresh. But Lord, I, I feel dry right now. It's okay. Because the nutrients are coming as you're in the word, as you're, as you're I'm, I'm replenishing and the branches are coming. Spring is here in your heart and your life. And God's like, I, hey, for us, we might be heading in the fall, but in your walk, God's like, spring's coming. Spring's coming and the branches are coming out. And God's like, I have, I have, listen, your coworkers at work that don't know me, I have you in their life for a reason. Your loved ones, your family, your friends that don't know me, I have you in their life for a reason. Your family members, your home is to be a sanctuary and I have you there for a reason. I have you on this earth for such a time as this. And listen, you might not know exactly what that means, but hey, it's just around the corner because the nutrients are there and he's pouring into your life through his word and he wants you to understand, I'm going to humble you. I'm going to bring into you my righteousness and my holiness so that you would be fruitful in your life. Is that you? Oh, it could be. Oh, I want it to be for me. Lord, here I am. Lord, I don't want to just pretend and play church and do things that, that make me look like a Christian or whatever, Lord. I don't want to live by a title, but Lord, I just want my life to be just abiding in you, me and you, God. Because that is what is going to make my family healthy. That is going to make my relationships healthy, that is what's going to make my ministry healthy and everything else, that I simply abide in Him. Where are you at?